Good afternoon and welcome and thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. We know your time is valuable and we appreciate you being here. My name is John Haldy and I'm the president of Haldy Tech. First off, I need to do a little bit of a disclaimer. This webinar, this live conversation, uh, Haldy Tech and FCS are not affiliated with nor are they endorsed by Federal Express Corporation and FedEx Ground. We're not officially representing them and anything we say here is our own opinion and ours alone. So just didn't want any confusion around that. For those of you who don't know, Haldy Tech is a software company that provides solutions designed specifically for FedEx ground line haul contractors. Our mission at Haldy Tech is to help you, line haul contractors, make more money and find more time in your day. We've heard from many of you that finding hours in a busy day is almost a better currency than otherwise, but we know that money is also the bottom line. Core to our mission is sharing information that we think is valuable to you. We do talk to a lot of line haul contractors and we're constantly asked how other people are doing things. You've made it clear to us that there aren't enough opportunities for you to talk to and hear from each other. Quick note, we've just created a Facebook group called FedEx Ground Line Haul Contractors. Nobody's on it yet because we just created it yesterday, but we thought this would be a better group targeted to just line haul contractors as opposed to larger groups that are predominantly P&D folks. Please, please, please feel free to join the group. We're hoping it will grow to be a great resource for you, and do tell others about it. Today's online conversation is the first of what we hope will be a regular series where you can come together and share experiences, ask and answer questions of each other, and hopefully learn things to help you be more successful in your business. So with that said, allow me to introduce today's panel. We have Kyle Benke with United Federal Logistics, Mike Schuyler from Skyco Distribution, and Jim Vore of Vorsic Transport. The format for today is pretty simple. Our panelists are going to have a conversation for about 30 to 40 minutes about best and worst practices that they've seen. If you have questions as they go along, please chat them through the Zoom app. I'll be monitoring the questions and we'll try to insert them as the conversation goes along. At the end of the 30 or 40 minute conversation, we'll shift entirely to Q&A and try to get to any questions we haven't already addressed. With that said, I'll kick things off by asking the following question, which we've heard a lot of lately. Gentlemen, what are your thoughts on the various ways to pay drivers? We've encountered CPM, weekly, daily, hourly, percent of revenue. Uh, we see people paying per diem, some people not paying per diem. We see minimums, we don't see minimums. How do these methods apply in your world and what are your opinions in terms of pros and cons? And how does it get driven by both the bottom line for you financially as well as driver retention, which is so critical? I can go first. Um, so we're very heavy on the team runs with, with our operation. Um, so most everything we do on the team side is is per mile. Um, we pay a per mile rate and we try to keep it simple. Um, when we calculate our per mile rates, try to, I try to factor in some average drop and hook pay and everything and kind of just build it in. Because one of the things we found when we first got started five years ago, we were doing things with, uh, you know, having, you know, meal allowance bonuses and different bonuses like that. And we were losing drivers to other contractors, even though we were still paying more, but they had, you know, there's their, their an extra two cents, but you know, the drivers didn't necessarily do the math to realize that the extra we were paying them was actually an extra five cents or something like that. So um, we started to bake everything in. It's a very simple model. Um, it's all per mile. Um, when FedEx gives their bonuses on holidays, we do a, we split the per mile incentive with them on those. And then, um, uh, so yeah, everything on that end is per mile. Um, most of our solo runs, as long as they're over the, you know, was it the 130 or 150 mile uh, threshold? It's you know, this, this, not the sliding scale rate. That's all per mile as well. Um, and then for shorter runs, um, say like shuttle runs, we're in Atlanta, so we got a lot of terminals that are 30 miles from each other. Um, you know, paying a per mile rate for those doesn't. Um, compensate the drivers enough so we do we figure out a flat rate for those um, basically under a certain mileage threshold it's been a certain it's a certain flat rate for that and we've been able to get those runs staffed once we started doing those um, you know, just for example say you're paying 50 cents a mile um, and it's it's only a 30 mile run and you know it's not they're not going to get they're only getting paid 15 bucks and having to do a full drop and hook drive through drive across town drive through traffic so um, for those type of runs, we do a, a flat rate. Um, and that's worked out fairly well. Um, we try to keep things simple so the driver can 
easily understand what they're going to make for the runs they're doing. So, um, so that, that boils down to what we do. Yeah, <clears throat> we actually do something quite similar to that. So if it's line haul, we pay by the mile. Um, we do, we have some team runs, but we're predominantly a solo uh, operator. And so we pay cents per mile for all the line haul, but any of the spots that we do, the local customer pickups, we do those on a flat rate. Um, and this has morphed into the into a very similar structure of what Kyle was talking about. We build everything into the one cents per mile rate we used to pay drop and hooks separate. We used to pay this separate, that separate, um, and all those things added up. And you know, somebody else would come in and say, "Offer them a penny or two more per mile." And they're like, "I'll do that," but you're actually making less. And so we we bake it all in into that cents per mile for the line haul part of it. Um, and, but the shorter runs and the spots, which are almost by definition shorter than 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 the mileage, like Kyle was talking about. Those are flat rate, and we work that out. And those are sometimes two, three, four dollars a mile. But and we'll tell the drivers that look, this this run is eighteen miles. You're going to get paid, you know, X dollars for that, um, and it equates to you know twenty five to thirty dollars an hour, or you know X cents per mile for that. So that works well. Um, another dynamic that we have seen, um, we've used some minimums uh, to as part of our. Uh, attracting drivers, uh, especially when we have unassigned runs in different locations. And that's a mixed bag. I'd say you have to be careful with that, right? So in one way, um, it's great. For, you take the risk away from the driver that they're not going to get enough miles to make a decent paycheck, right? And so sometimes when you're recruiting a driver and you have uncertainty as to exactly how many miles you're going to get on an unassigned run, um, you need to do that. Uh, but then you have to be very careful that you're managing that closely because there's an incentive, as we say, that some drivers will do the minimum to get the minimum. And you end up paying the minimum and the driver might be going into the window and say, hey, yeah, I know you have this, you know, 450 mile run for me, but I wouldn't mind a, you know, a 200 mile run or, hey, I'm not feeling so great tonight. Can you just not have me do that second turn and end up, you know, you end up, it, it's hard for you to see that unless you're on top of it and you're having communications active communications with the line hall office where that's happening, just be wary of, of, of those minimums, especially over time. Um, so that's one thing that we've definitely seen. We still will use a minimum selectively, but what we like to do in every case is try to incentivize, um, you know, the drivers who, the drivers who want to work more, get more. Um, and so we, we build in some bonuses and things like that on our team runs, we have some thresholds that if the team runs, like if it's a team that's running wild, we'll bump up all of their pay if they hit certain thresholds by a couple of cents a mile. Um, and, and, and it just incentivizes the, the drivers who want to work, they get, they get rewarded financially for working more. Um, yeah, going off what you said too with the minimums, um, yeah, it is a, it is a double-edged sword because um, we see it sometimes, especially on the teams, um, you know, with the, you gotta be careful when you have it with the, with the week cutoff, cause you know, you're still running a lot of times Monday through Friday, Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday. Um, so you got guys that sometimes will hold a run so they can get that extra minimum on one week, get a couple extra hundred dollars and then they get all their miles loaded on the other week. And, um, so, um, so you have that and then, yeah, just drivers knowing that they get a certain minimum. Um, now we, we, we set our minimums pretty low. Um, um, so it incentivizes them, Hey, I know I'm going to get the minimum, but if I work hard, I'm going to get three or 400 more dollars, you know, that week to do it. Um, and then the other thing we do, I forgot to mention this. We also, we, last year we started doing it. It's been pretty receptive is for each year of service. We give them an extra cent per mile and, um, we add a hundred dollars to their, uh, weekly minimum, which the weekly minimum is also what we pay on vacation time. So, um, so, uh, so that incentivizes guys. Hey, they know the longer they stay with us, you know, we've got guys that are getting, you know, three hundred dollars, three four hundred dollars over the minimum because they've been with us three or four years. So, um, so those those have helped a lot too. Yeah, I think treating your current drivers as the number one place that you recruit is is an important thing to do. So, 
you know, truck drivers are the, the most actively recruited profession in the country by far. Uh, in the Northeast, I think the number two industry with the number of unique ads targeting that is oil and gas industry in the Northeastern United States. And uh, I think there's a survey that, that showed that there were something like 26,000 unique ads for oil and gas industry um, in, in the first couple of months of this year. And by comparison, truck drivers had 950,000 unique ads targeting them. So it's like 25 times, you know, the number of, uh, or, 20, or 15 times the number of, of targeted ads to truck drivers compared to other industries. So, um, so yeah, we, we definitely are proactive with our current drivers. Um, retention is your first recruiting. So uh, we wanna have uh, an active dialogue on that and making sure people are incentivized well. Jim, do you, when you, you mentioned flat rates for spots, do you yeah. find a need to pay a different flat rate to a more experienced driver versus a newer driver? Nope, not at all. Um, I think the drivers like the certainty of what they're going to get. And if it's fair, then you know, we've had no, no pushback on that whatsoever. Um, so that flat rate has been very simple and we have not differentiated. And it makes our payroll process a lot simpler because we could just assign one flat rate to a spot and, and whoever does that spot is going to get paid that amount. Um, and then we have a, for our, our drivers who are cents per mile, we're obviously, you know, tallying up the, their mileage for the week and, and just referencing what each driver's pay rate is cents per mile. So it, keep, it makes the payroll calculations pretty simple by keeping a single flat rate for each spot. Just for some context, do you have any drivers who do something like 80, 90 percent spots or mm -hmm. yeah, I've got a couple I've, I've got I've got a couple uh, who do a hundred percent spots. and there are other contractors out there who have five, six, seven uh, drivers who do who do spots. there's 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 a contractor in Buffalo. he's doing spots all day long uh, with like five or six drivers. Um, and it used to be years ago, uh, spots were horrible and nobody wanted them and uh, everybody wanted just the line haul miles and the spots did pay very poorly a number of years ago and I would say about four years ago four or five years ago FedEx made a conscious effort saying we we need to service these customers better and we need to incentivize the line haul uh, company contractors to do the spots and so now and the way that we price it uh, our margins are about the same on spots and line haul and our drivers are compensated fairly consistently. So ours are kind of indifferent between doing spots and line haul. Um, so we've got pure spots drivers. We've got drivers who spend their day combination of spots and line haul. And then we've got pure line haul drivers. And the ones who are doing both, it's kind of personal preference if they like to have a long trip and you know drive. And some people just like to be a little more active and getting in and out of the truck more often with the spots. Have either of you ever thought about doing some sort of a percent of revenue pay plan? I haven't. And the main reason for that is I don't really want drivers being able to figure out what we actually make. I think that's one of the reasons. And then two, again, too, it's, it's uh, you know, you're disclosing now a lot of, for me, that's disclosing a lot of information I don't want to disclose. Um, you know, have to have out there. And then, um, and then again, it goes back to the simplicity factor. Um, it's, uh, you know, you, you know, calculate your miles times the rate and that that's, you know, that, that, that's easy. Um, so those are the two main reasons. No, I've never considered a percentage of revenue. Yeah. I think keeping it simple is easier, uh, and more straightforward. Um, so we haven't, we haven't actively explored that. I know some contractors who have tried that. Uh, I think it tends to be more consistent for the for the spots rather than line haul when somebody pays a certain percentage of the spot rate. But um, I think that to just keep it simple is, has been the the mantra for us. Kyle, forgive me when you, when you were talking earlier, I got distracted by something. Did you say you don't do per diems or you do do per diems? Um, we do do a per diem, but what we do is we convert a portion of, we con convert their pay. So if you, we figure out, you know, if they're getting paid 50 cents a mile, 
or say, say their checks a thousand thousand dollars a week then we go through and figure out how many days they're on the road and then uh, you're allowed to i think deduct up to six or sixty three dollars a day is per diem so then we go through and figure out how many days they were on the road and then convert then we convert part of their pay to the per diem so say it say the per diem portion is three hundred dollars so then you still pay them the full thousand, but three hundred dollars of that is non-taxable, and then you're reducing now your um, taxable wages to seven hundred. So it helps the drivers because they get a higher they get higher take-home pay, and it helps us on the other end because it reduces our um, our actual payroll, which in turn reduces your payroll taxes. Jim, are you in the same boat? Yeah, we do the same. It's only for the team drivers who are staying out. Uh, on the road away from home. Uh, so solo drivers are not eligible for per diems, only the team drivers who are away from home. Um, so that's, you know, that's the, and we do the same thing. We take a portion of the, the total pay and carve that out for the per diem. Um, there are some companies out there, some big trucking companies that put it out there and they actually charge a different amount. They'll, they'll say, the, or they'll pay their drivers a different amount if they want the per diem or not. They actually reduce the rate that they pay for their team drivers if they're taking the per diem. Um, and they're, so they're saying, look, we're giving you a tax benefit by doing this. And then, and then uh, they're keeping a portion of it themselves. We don't go that far. We, put, we, we just say, if you're on teams, you're gonna be able to carve out per diem for the days that you're actually away from home. Mm -hmm. So okay. yeah, we, do it, we do it the same way. We do it the same way too with, uh, it, it, you gotta have an overnight stay. So like the, our solo drivers that are home daily, you can't do it. It's gotta be away from home, away from an area. So solos, it's, and there's not many solos anymore that are layover runs. Um, so it's only a handful of solo runs now. So mainly, it's mainly on the team side. Yeah. I would, I know some contractors who have done that. They've paid per diem for solo drivers. I would not recommend that. We do not do it at all. Because if you get knocked on the door by the IRS, they're gonna they're gonna string you up for that, right? It's uh, mm -hmm. it's something that they will focus on, and um, and you know just you know do it where it's legitimate and don't try to press it. There's a question from the group. Yep. Um, how do you determine flat rates for spots? The way I do it is I look at the total. I look at the revenue. I actually look at the revenue net of fuel, um, and then I make it consistent with my percentage of line haul revenue that I that I pay drivers. So on a net on a percentage of revenue x fuel is how I do. Then I do that consistent with. Uh, so I'm paying consistently with line haul. Um, you Does that say, make sense? You say net of fuel. I've looked at the settlements enough. God help me. Um, that there's a fuel supplement, fuel amount in there, but that's amount paid above and beyond the baseline rate of about two bucks a gallon that they bake into your standard mileage mm -hmm. rate. Um, do you try to net it out beyond there or are you just talking about the supplement portion? Just the supplement portion, just keeping it simple. You could be more, you could be a little more tailored to it than that. Uh, but the other way that I, so I do that from, to make sure that it's reasonable from a, from a financial perspective. So I think about it from my perspective is, are the margins on this part of my business um, good? Are they better or worse than line haul? And, and so that's one thing, does it fit with me? And then the other part of it is from the driver's perspective, how much time is this gonna take? How much work is it? How many drop of notes do I have? How much time does it take? And am I getting adequately compensated for that? So if I have a spot that's relatively short and, um, and it takes about 45 minutes for somebody to do start to finish. And I'm paying 20, 20 bucks for that. That usually works fine for our drivers, right? Um, something that's a little longer, you know, we're going to pay more. Or if you have double drop and hooks, that sort of thing. So looking at it both ways, you, I end up coming to pretty similar numbers uh, on that. And, um, and frankly, I think the FedEx probably does the same thing on their end, say, how much do we need to pay for this? Um, and so then it ends up being, you know, we do, we do not have a big issue or complaint from, we don't have complaints from drivers about spot pay, pay being too low. Um, and from a financial perspective, we found that they're, that they're consistent with our, with the rest of our line haul business. 
Yeah, we don't really run many spots. Um, but what I did with our with our sh- pay that you know includes your shuttles with those short runs, um, I went through and kind of did something similar to what Jim did. With uh, we figure out kind of what the what's the, what's the total pay for that uh, for that particular run, and then so we know that we're not just cutting out all of our margin from it. And then um, we tried to make it where it's consistent enough with, uh, you know, say say you got a driver, all they do is shuttles all night, you know, so 30 mile trips to and from terminals, that it's consistent, you know, they're still working a full night, they're still working an eight to 11 hour shift, um, but the pay is gonna then be comparable to what they might make on say, a, you know, a 500 mile run or a 400 mile run. And um, you usually can do that because the per mile rate, you have that sliding scale of per mile rate. So, you know, some of these runs are paying, you know, two to $3 a mile. And you have that margin built in there where you still can pay a higher rate to the drivers on a shuttle and, and incentivize them to do it. Um, so, cause that's always a challenge, you know, getting a guy that's used to running, you know, you know, a team that's used to running, you know, thousand mile trips or, you know, solo guy that, you know, it's always doing just a straight run, 200, two to 300 miles, get them to incentivize them to do a shuttle is not always easy. And so we've been pretty successful with that now with, um, with the way we've been doing that pay and building that out on a, on, on, a, on those shorter runs. Gotcha. I, I see Mike is, is connecting. Let's hope that it gets his audio and, and video going here. Um, I'm going to take a moment here and just remind everyone that if they have questions as we're going, uh, I am watching the Q&A panel. So there's a thing on the bottom of your screen. You can type questions, and I promise I'll try my best to get them all, all fed in there to the conversation. Um, do you think, uh, especially with Mike coming on, because he's like a, a fuel guru, we could transition to uh, talking a little bit about fuel because it's such a big expense item for y'all? Um my question to to you all was there's FedEx fuel at a lot of terminals, which is down at, at wholesale costs versus retail fuel. I've heard a lot of conflicting opinions where there's there's complaints that FedEx fuel might be dirtier fuel and causes more headaches with fuel filters. I've heard uh, issues um, where people don't want to bother their drivers and tell them they have to fuel there because drivers prefer going elsewhere. It's more convenient. Can you share some of your experiences there and, and how it might have affected the bottom line for y'all? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, 43 cents a gallon, that's the number. That's the difference in Pennsylvania between wholesale fuel costs at FedEx and retail fuel costs at Pilot or Flying J or you know, the other, the other retail outlets. So 43 cents a gallon. Um, and that is enormous when you're doing millions of miles, right? Um, or even if you're not doing that many miles, it, it's still, you know, it's, it's, it's linear, right? So you're, if you're getting seven and a half miles per gallon, you're, you, you know, your, your percentages on your revenues uh, is consistent with that. So we have a company policy where we are, we require our drivers to fuel at FedEx terminals if they are going through a FedEx terminal, okay? That is the requirement. And I did this a couple of years ago um, and I, I saw a dramatic improvement in our, in our you know, margins because we weren't paying this excessive amount for the fuel. And at first we had some pushback from a few of the drivers and they were like, look, I, you know, I got everything from, well, I'm not getting paid to, to fuel or I got, um, you know, I'm not getting my pilot points if I'm not fu- fueling at, at the FedEx terminal. And then I got one say, somebody w- said, hey, you want to, sp- can, can I split it with you, right? Can I split the difference? And I said, sure. I said, um, you know, when you fuel at FedEx, it's one price. You fuel at retail, it's 43 cents a gallon more. How much of that 43 cents do you want to pay? And they're like, wait, 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 that, you're saving 43 cents. I'm like, no, my starting point is I'm fueling at FedEx. You're going through FedEx. That's my starting point, right? And to fuel somewhere else, it's going to cost that much extra. I'm happy to, if you want to cut, bring, pull that out of your pocket. And, and of course, the answer was, no, 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 I'll, I'll, just fuel, I'll just fuel at FedEx. So I think we're running about 80 to 90% every week that's fueling at FedEx. Some of our runs don't go through FedEx terminals. Um, and so you, we need to buy retail fuel in that regard. Um, but one other thing we did do is we do have some runs that don't go through a FedEx terminal with fuel, 
but they do go past one uh, on route. And I will pay our drivers extra to take the time to pull off, go into that terminal, unhook the trailer, fuel the truck, hook back up and go on. Um, and so um, it takes them an extra 20 minutes or so uh, compared to regular fueling. I will pay extra for that. We keep a record of that. They just put it in their logs and, uh, and we do it that way. So that one, we are splitting the difference because they're going out of their way in order to, uh, in order to fuel at a FedEx facility. On the topic of fuel filters, I will gladly pay for fuel filters. Um, and, and if there is dirty fuel, I think FedEx has actually gotten a lot better in terms of the fuel. This year, we didn't have any starting issues or freezing and gelling issues. And our fuel filters were not replacing as frequently as what we had previously. Um, I think they dialed back the bio part of the biofuel in the in in some of the locations where we operate. Um, so um, I will I will you can go through a lot of fuel filters for saving forty three cents a gallon. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll admit we're not the best at managing the fuel. With us being primarily teams, we got a lot of teams that run out west, and it's 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 really hard to. Um, you know, especially once you get past, basically once you get past Dallas, there's not a lot of places to go. So, um, so we do have a lot of fuel that's purchased outside, um, you know, plug for Haldi tech. They do have a really nice fuel and uh, fuel purchase analyzer too. They can show you how much they save. So now that we're starting to use that software, we're starting to look at that and see how we can come up with some incentives for, for drivers to do it. It's been tough because like you said, we wanted to keep, we want to keep that simplicity in the pay. Um, but you know, when a guy, when a guy fills up at the TA across the street from the terminal and just cost you, you know, an extra 60, 70 bucks for that gas. And so he can get a free shower or a free, you know, free sandwich that that's not fun. Um, but, uh, overall we can sometimes we deal with it cause we do have a lot of unassigned teams and especially in this current driver market and push comes to shove, I don't want to lose a driver over, over that because i'm still making good margins and still making good margins on these teams and so i don't want to be it's a fine line that i we dance and i talk with my managers about it like um you don't want to push it too hard sometimes because just the losing drivers on that end and so um uh so so we we're still trying to we're we're us ourselves trying to come up with a way that we can incentivize the guys to get it to do it and um to buy more at fedex terminals but uh, most of our guys especially around the locals they run they buy a fuel at FedEx it's mainly our teams that are out over the road that uh, we have we have that issue with um, and as far as fuel quality um, we don't see too many fuel quality issues except in the winter um, it's usually you know from that November to say March time frame um, there's times we get bad fuel but it's hard to tell if it came from a truck stop or if it came from FedEx because um, we, we know we did it because we know we have we have a truck that just came out of P, out of the PM and then it starts running poorly and then you take it, you know, get it at a shop or a road call and they say, hey, the fuel filters are clogged and they're clogged. They were just changed like six or seven days ago. Um, so we run into it, but it's, it's we've never really been able to point, pinpoint it to one place or another. Um, it's just something we do and we we make sure that there's we're able to just change fuel filters. That's a quick fix and uh, keeps things keeps things going. So. Mike, one, thing, well, one of the things we've been trying to figure out is uh, a simple way weekly to process and determine the net cost per mile. So what I'm looking for is not just the efficiency, but after our fuel surcharge, what did it cost us per mile? And uh, we haven't found a simple way to do that. So we're still working and just tracking the guys' uh, fuel economy. But there's a difference. You know, I ran some uh, numbers the other day and give you an example of net. Uh, my guy's fuel and at the hub. We had a range of 12 and a half to 15 uh, on our, yeah, 16, 17 cents a mile net fuel cost. And for the trucks that weren't fueling at the hub, uh, 19 and 25. So there's a difference. But the other thing too we found is if you get to know your vendors and know what vendors and what routes you're on, uh, there is potential savings there. And one of the vendors we use is Sab Brothers, but that's really only located to our region. Uh, so it doesn't help you guys run in cross country. As far as the fuel quality go, one of the issues we had this winter was trying to get FedEx to give us number one for the, uh, the Plains region. And they just wouldn't get on board. 
but at the same time, if you run into Denver or Chicago, we've been having pretty good luck on getting good quality winterized fuel that's blended. There's a question from, from the group um, about measuring fuel efficiency on a weekly basis. Um, this person saying that they average about six and a half miles per gallon, and they're wondering if you all could offer some color on whether that compares favorably or unfavorably to your mile per gallon. You know, winter operations. Um, I'll go with, uh, winter operations go ahead, pretty Mike. hard on fuel. Uh, we find that we're somewhere around six five to seven and a quarter during the winter operations, and as the temperatures uh, warm up and we get better quality of fuel, our range steps up. Um, right now, these sheets I have, I have a seven point one eight, a six point six, a uh, seven point nine, and a six point eight, and that was from the most recent pay cycle. Yeah. Um, for oh, us, um, what's that? We yeah. saw your 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 lead analyst behind you. Yeah, yeah, it's spring break. Been a blast. Um, I'll tell you, for us, um, all of our fleet, just so we so you know what we're using, we're using all Mac and Volvo tractors. Um, so we use Mac Anthems with the with the HE engine packages, which is our high efficiency engine, and um, we see on those anywhere between 7.2 and 7 point, uh, I'm looking here, um, 7.2 and 7.65 miles per gallon on ours. Um, when I've isolated it to some um, that's just pulling 53s, you can get close to eight um, with, with our trucks, but we're, we're in that, all of our trucks are over seven and it looks like they're yeah, ranging from about 7.2 to 7.65. Uh, I, got, I have one here. It's actually a Volvo that I look at. It's 7.8, um, but that one runs a local run, so that, that's kind of uh, it's, it's not seeing quite as much idle time and things like that. And just just for us too, we have a lot of idle time because we have unassigned teams, so they're getting to the terminal and then sitting overnight waiting for a run. So I think our numbers could be better if we didn't have all that idle time. So yeah, for the guys operating in the south, for their or single axle tractors. And if you spec the frame right, you can pull the 53 still, you're gonna automatically save a half mile per gallon and pulling a 53, you're gonna save a whole mile per gallon with a single axle. So that's a good way to cut your fuel cost. Yeah, in, in Erie, Pennsylvania, we don't go with single axle. <laughs> um, we're right around, we're right around seven, six for our average. Um, and we have a range, you know, set about seven two to seven eight. I would say is sort of a good range. But every every quarter, I have about ten percent of my fleet that's over eight, um, and those tend to be the Volvos. They tend to be the newer Volvos with the XE package, you know, extreme efficiency package, or the HE package for the Mac Anthem. We're running Volvo VNLs, mostly VNLs. Um, and uh, we run some Mac anthems as well. So we do get, you know, half a dozen trucks every every quarter that are consistently above eight miles to a gallon. And, and those are nice. If there's something that's running below six, you know, we had a couple of older trucks, you know, 500 horsepower uh, standards, you know, older truck, high mileage, that sort of thing. Um, we'll trade it, you know, um, you know, you, even if you, even if you, think that truck is still good value and all that kind of good stuff and it runs great and all that. Yeah, but you'll you'll eat up your extra cost and fuel uh, very easily for that. So we got a couple more upgrades to do in the fleet, but we've spent a lot over the past two years really upgrading the fleet. And fuel was the driver of a lot of that, not necessarily additional maintenance costs, but but fuel economy. It's a big deal. We have one team operation runs four days and we went from 5.8 to 6.2 to save $30,000 a year. The driver was just floored in the value. Yeah, it pays for your truck. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a question from the group. Um, and, and Jim, I know you're going to laugh at this one. Um, can anyone explain how the FedEx ground quarterly fuel tax invoices are calculated and how I might verify the accuracy? <laughs> Who wants to have it that one? Uh, I don't know if I can answer Actually, that. When we switched our own the last year, so I haven't even been looking at that in a while. So, yeah. 
I, I actually do know the answer to that, if, uh, if, if you want. I'll be quick, right? Every state has a fuel tax. Uh, you know, it differs uh, by state, obviously. And if the is the way that they basically equate it, so you're paying for your fuel tax in the miles you drive in each state, right? That's the gist of if them why the, why they have that. Um, so you from all the IVMRs that you submit, whether you do it electronically or you do it in the paper ones, FedEx is keying all of that information into their system. They're calculating how many miles you drove in each state. They take the fuel from the T checks that they had, and they're calculating how much fuel tax you paid in each state. And then they're making the adjustments higher or lower based on where you actually drove compared to where you where you purchased your fuel. Because the objective is that you should be paying based on your average miles per gallon, you should be paying for your fuel tax based on how many miles you drove in that state. So if I drove all my miles in Ohio and I bought all of my fuel in Pennsylvania, I'm supposed to make, there should be a transfer uh, from Pennsylvania fuel tax to Ohio because I was using the roads and paying a bit. Um, our, and we've just exited the FedEx IFTA package. Uh, we, don't, we don't do it anymore through FedEx. We're paying our own fuel tax. We're, we have our own IFTA stickers and all that. Um, and the reason why we did that wasn't because the FedEx system was bad in terms of those quarterly statements, but for the state of Pennsylvania, um, anything above eight miles to a gallon, they said doesn't, doesn't work, it doesn't compute. And they default everything to four miles per gallon because they say you can't have more than eight from a fuel efficiency perspective. And it was doubling our fuel tax. And we run a lot of miles in Pennsylvania. And this was, this was every quarter, it was a battle and a debate. And I know other contractors who face the same battle and just throw up their hands and say, I'm not gonna fight it. We fought it, we've gotten it. We've got many adjustments to the fuel based on us demonstrating that we get more than eight miles to a gallon on certain trucks. Uh, but it was just too much of a pain. And filing fuel taxes is actually pretty simple. So um, we opted out and, uh, and, and we don't have any of those issues. Uh, we don't expect to have any of those issues as we're filing our own quarterly taxes. If someone's, if you plan right, you should be getting a refund every quarter. And depending on the size of your fleet, it should be substantial. But you really have to plan out and tell your guys where to buy fuel. You don't want to be buying in Missouri when 17 cents tax and you're running in a state that's 32 cents. You're going to owe money. Can you expand on that a little, Mike? Because wouldn't it all net out either way? You're either loaning the government money or they're loaning it to you? No, not at all, because every state varies. Uh, you can actually go online and Google the if the state taxes and they'll tell you what the cent, how many cents per state. Um, let me pull up an example here. Uh, Iowa. Iowa is 32 and a half, I believe. So, and if you're running in Missouri, like I run 14 miles. Yeah. So I run 14 miles in Iowa crossing, right? Through I-29 and Highway 2 getting on 80. Missouri is 17 cents. If I go buy my fuel in Missouri and I think I saved money because it looked like a lower cost, FedEx is going to adjust my cost based on that OPUS program. Then in the end, I will owe the state of Iowa money because Missouri will give me a refund for the miles I did not drive in their state. In turn, we give it to Iowa. Problem is, that 17 cent calculation, you're going to come up short on the 32 cent. So take, if I buy all my fuel in Iowa, I pay 32 and a half cents tax at the pump. I'm paying more at the pump. FedEx is paying me more on my fuel surcharge. So in turn, at the end of the quarter, I'm getting a big refund. I can apply that 32 cents refund to the Missouri tax at 17 and I put money in my pocket. I see. So the difference is you're collecting a higher fuel supplement per gallon because of that chart right. in your contract that says, what'd you pay for it? Yeah. So given the example in the KCMO network, we have a hub on the Missouri side and we have a hub on the Kansas side and Missouri is 17. Uh, let's look, see what Kansas is currently. Kansas is currently 26. So you can see the difference. If you're operating more and you're running through, you might as well just stop at Lenexa and buy fuel. Say for instance, you're doing a cross country, Atlanta to Denver. Instead of stopping in Missouri by the fuel, go ahead and go to the Lenexa side, buy the fuel at the hub there, you're better off. Because what is it, a, a few pennies per mile that you get if you go and get into a higher bracket for the fuel supplement? You know, uh, like Jim was explaining, it's, it's a long subject, but 
once you figure your fuel mileage per state, that state determines that you drove so many miles, they're gonna figure how many gallons you should have used in their state, and that is your bill. If you follow me. Right, so if I'm okay. following you, absent the FedEx fuel supplement, it really wouldn't matter, but because of the fuel supplement, it does. Uh, because of the fuel supplement, it does matter, but even when it doesn't, just because the state look, give you an example, if you cross in Missouri to Kansas, and it just looks like you're saving five cents to buy fuel in Missouri, and truly you're not, because the difference between the 26 and 17 is more than five, right? I got gotcha. you. So, you know, large corporations or large trucking corporations have an entire software package that helps them manage, and it takes into account all these little factors. So even if for them, it matters. Yeah. As a, as a general rule, it's probably best to fuel in high tax states. Um, and then you're getting credits and then you can get credits back. Uh, we have found that um, fueling at FedEx terminals uh, rather than retail will dominate though, right? So you save more on buying fuel at FedEx then you do, like I buy fuel in FedEx in Ohio um, and I run Pennsylvania miles and there's a big difference in the, the, the fuel tax in those two states. Um, but um, the savings on the fuel itself in FedEx versus non FedEx is bigger than the benefit of uh, being in a higher tax state. Pennsylvania Mike, take a look at that. It should be 74 cents a gallon, I think, in Pennsylvania, highest in the country. Yes. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. All right. So, so we would be incentivized to fuel in, in Pennsylvania, but a lot of our locations don't have fuel. I am not going to complain about 26 anymore. No, don't don't complain Ohio about is 47. <laughs> right. And, and just for everybody listening, um, we've seen in the data that literally your mileage may vary in the sense that there are some areas where the difference between retail and wholesale fuel is actually very tight, some markets. So you do need to look at your settlements to understand that because in other places, I mean, we've seen 90 cents a gallon. I mean, it's absurd. Um, but in some places, it's been 10 cents a gallon. Yeah. But this, this call is helpful for me because I run a run from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Columbus, Ohio every day. And quite frankly, I haven't looked at where that guy's fuel it because both of them have fuel islands. Like I'm going to say fuel in Pennsylvania and run it to Ohio and come back and just keep fueling up at your home base as opposed to fueling, you know, on your break when you're halfway through. So Mike, thank you. I'm going to take a look at that. That one run in particular <laughs> might save me a little bit of money. Thank you. We have barbecue money at the end yeah. of the board. That's right. <laughs> um, we've gotten a bunch of questions uh, since we started and, and some of them went back um, uh uh, Kristen, I'm going to ask you if what they talked about earlier about determining the rate for spots didn't cover it, put a new question in because I think that both Kyle and Jim talked about that at length. Um, there was another question. Do you all have an, back to payroll, do you all have an average salary for X amount of miles and, and how is the bonuses that are added on calculated? Do you have a sense for what the annual rate should be for a driver who does a certain amount of miles per year? Um, we don't do it. I mean, our drivers, our team drivers average, I'd say between 80 and 95,000 a year is what, what they're making. Um, but we don't do any salary. It's basically all based on the miles that they run. So, um, you don't drive, you don't get paid basically. <laughs> um, so, um, and then the only time we really do bonuses, unless we do, um, unless we're doing just like an overall like Christmas bonus or something like that. Um, like when FedEx does the holiday bonuses, like Christmas, New Year's Day, Memorial Day, Labor Day for working over that, we just we just calculate the miles they ran on those days. And um, we do that through our GPS tracker. And so we can isolate those miles and then we pay them for those trips. So um, and they get the extra miles on there. Um, as far as that, there's no, we don't do any salaries for any drivers. I'm kind of like what we talked about at the beginning. Um, if there's no motivation for the driver to hit us, you know, to just run miles and you give them a flat rate, then you'll be cutting yourself short as the owner because you'll have drivers that are looking for ways to just not, not work as hard to get the same amount of pay. Um, 
by the way, for folks listening, um, I think we've kind of reached the area where it's kind of wide open for Q&A. So it, it's a free for all. And I'm going to throw one out. How do you recruit for your teams? <laughs> we spend a lot of money. <laughs> That's how we recruit for teams. Um, it's hard. Teams are hard. Um, we're in Atlanta. It's a competitive market. You got to have a presence out there. Um, have, you got to have ads out on the major markets, on, on the major job boards. And you need to be spending enough to where you're on page one or two. Um, and so, uh, and I think having a good social media strategy, um, need to be on social media. We've been on social, on Facebook and Instagram for about the past, uh, about the past year. And so, and then don't get stale. Don't, you know, we're always constantly trying something new. I kind of leave a little bit in my, my recruiting budget to try something new because you know, job boards go out of style with drivers we found. So we keep, you know, keep having to kind of move back and forth and change the strategy because, um, you know, especially with teams, it's, that's the hardest thing to, to recruit for. And um, so you just got to stay on there and just never stop. Um, if you got, you know, I, I always encourage guys, if you've got, uh, you know, if you're only, if you're contracted for 10 trucks, run 12 and get, have 12 in there. So that way, if you've got, Two extra. If you got an extra team that week, run them so they're working because FedEx will find work for teams. Um, but you can never stop recruiting for teams. Then um, you just because you're um, fully, you say you're fully staffed, you're gonna have guys leave and they come in waves. You'll you'll lose, you know, you lose one or two teams and then now you're now you're stuck trying to catch them. So hire hire as many as you can and and try to keep them keep them working. Mike, I saw you nodding. Are you thinking the same thing? Yep, I agree. Recruit all the time and and keep an idea or keep an open mind to new ideas. And, and the more we communicate with each other, the more we you know help each other and uh, share ideas. It helps. Jim, are you on the same page there? Recruit early, recruit often. Yeah, you have to keep recruiting. It's nonstop. Um, it's uh, it's like I said, the drivers are getting recruited more than any other industry by far. And so you just have to stay on top of that. Um, and depending on your market, you may or may not be seeing growth opportunities. So you got to get ahead of the curve because FedEx is going to definitely smile on the ones who have resources there, whether it's trucks and drivers. If you're running a couple of spares in a location and you're there every day and you're running it, they're going to want to give that growth opportunity to you if it comes up. Um, if you're always struggling and not covering all your runs and taking declines, then they're going to say, mm, you know, do what you got assigned right now well before I give you growth opportunities. Um, and that's not always easy to do, you know. And we definitely stretched ourselves this year, right? This past year, there were a tremendous number of growth opportunities. We took on a bunch. And, uh, and it's been a challenge. I mean, it's, it was great to take a lot of growth. Don't get me wrong. But if you can't, you know, right now, we're just working to solidify all, all that growth that we did take so that mm -hmm. we can be well positioned because we do think there's some growth in some more areas, um, but we want to make sure that we do our job well on what we already have first. That's first priority. Yeah. Focus on the growth after. Yeah. And I was going to say too, thinking about the, the driver market, what's happened in the past year um, with COVID, a lot of driver schools were closed because of COVID because it was, you know, the, being able to be in the truck with an instructor didn't meet, you know, guidelines. And so you had a lot of, you lost probably six to eight months of, of the pipeline and now we we don't recruit you know new new drivers but you look all you know all the big companies that have their own driving schools you know if they weren't able to operate those and bring drivers in during that time um that that shrunk the market you know so that's got to catch back up and so you're you know you got to stay on top of recruiting just because the market's gotten smaller over the last year and you factor in the other things like the drug and alcohol clearinghouse i mean we've had several applicants that have been you know, disqualified from that because of the drug and alcohol clearinghouse. They've had, you know, previous issues there. Um, and then now you're competing with basically sitting on the couch with the extended unemployment benefits. And so it, it's very important to keep that employment and recruiting presence out there. And, um, and I go with Jim said, it's been tough with the growth we had and, and things there. It's not, uh, it's not an easy, this is one of, I don't know if it's the toughest we've seen it since we've been in business, but it's one of the toughest years for recruiting um, that I've seen. Um, it's up there with maybe say 2016, 2017 timeframe. And so, uh, um, 
and you know it, it kind of goes with the spot market and spot market rates are high then um the the employment the trucking employment's going to tighten and when those rates go back down then it'll be easier to hire so so in those time, and then those times when it's easier to hire, really focus on your employee retention. A lot of guys that have been with us two or three years came from that those times when the when the rates were low and we we're able to get them in and you know treat them right. They get a good paycheck and they're they're not they don't want to leave. So um, you know manage those ups and downs very well with the, with, the, with the driver market. There's a question here: Do team drivers make more or less per mile than your your day solo drivers? Our team drivers make about 15 cents a mile more than a solo driver. Same. And that's, that's also based off, that's also just based off the of FedEx rates as well. You know, FedEx pays a higher rate for teams and um, we pay a higher rate for teams. Same. Actually, I'm sorry, about 10 cents a mile, sorry. Ours are about 12, 12 to 14, depending. Same here. Um, we're going to jump around a little because there's a question that's been waiting. Um, going back to fuel, how do you keep your drivers from fueling non FedEx? <laughs> you know, I've taken the time to explain uh, the process to them and help hoping that they're understanding and the profitability of the company and also their fuel incentive. Uh, they'll work with me. Uh, that's why one reason I'd like to get to the point where we change our fuel incentive to be calculated based on the net fuel cost. So you're paying something extra when they're behaving the way you want. Not yet. I'd like to get it that way. I pay them a fuel incentive, but it's not based on where they buy fuel. I'd like to go ahead and find a formula where I could easily get that tangible number without having to spend an hour each week doing it. Right. So you're paying a fuel incentive fuel. based on what? Fuel economy or? Yes, just on economy. So how do you do that when you have drivers pulling either different trucks or you know somebody's doing empty 53s versus loaded sets you know you're going to get very different fuel economy luck of the draw luck i had a guy draw. pulling 53s last week with a single axle and he killed it yeah you know? well, it is so luck of the draw some of the guys like i said uh, we got anywhere from 6.6 .6 up to 7.9 last week yeah, yeah that, that's a challenge that we've had because you know, as I said earlier, you don't want to you don't want to penalize the guy for, you know, especially in a really hard to in a really hard to hire position, like say unassigned teams um, for that fuel. But it, it really comes down to just educating them. And we've had guys, I mean, once you explain it to them, like, hey, okay, wow, that really makes a lot of difference. And so some guys care, some guys don't. Um, so we try to make it. We just try to keep the messaging out there to the drivers. Um, it doesn't always work. I'm still always going to have a, a team. When uh, there was at Hartford, there's a TA right across from Hartford. There's a TA right across from Portland. I'm always going to have a team that drives across the street and put $500 worth of fuel in their tractor when they could have got it for 400 or 350 at the FedEx terminal. We always have those, and we talk with the guys. But um, it's it's for us. It's really just getting those just making it aware because um, we haven't really, I haven't come up with a incentive program yet that I'm comfortable with um, and my, and our managers are comfortable with. There used to be drivers of putting out there just because one of the, like we said, the simplicity of the pay and, you know, just how do you, it's a, to me, it's a fine line because you can lose drivers over the fact that they don't get their pilot points. And I, I wish it wasn't the case, but you, you will. And so we, you know, we, we try to do it based on communication right now versus any kind of incentive. Yeah, we, we just talk with the drivers and, uh, and the whole DTEC system makes it really easy to see um, who is fueling mm -hmm. at FedEx and who's not fueling at FedEx because it maps the trip with the fuel in that truck that day. So you can see that driver Joe or Mary or whoever was driving that truck that day and fueled it in or outside of FedEx. So it's very quick and easy to determine who's fueling it, which of the drivers are fueling at FedEx and which aren't. And then it's really conversation with them. Um, they get it. Like, look, I like to, you know, share as much with the drivers. We're, we're pretty generous as far as contractors go, especially in our markets where we tend to be on the much more generous side. And, uh, and our drivers know that. And one of the things that I say is, look, we want to be able to do that 
if if that money is going through pilot and out the stack, then it's not going to come in your pocket at the end of the day. Um, and the drivers, the drivers are really receptive. They get it, right? They get why would I pay forty three cents a gallon more um, outside? That doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So we, we we have pretty pretty high level of compliance. Yeah, and just talking to them, I found like you said, sharing that our logic with them and showing them the bottom line and the difference. And sometimes there's some compromise. Uh, my Salt Lake team, he likes to stop at one point. So we we agreed to disagree on some of the stuff, but what he does is he stops and gets about 25, 30 gallons. Each time he goes to that location, he gets his showers. It's either that or I'll pay for a shower. It's worth yeah. the safe. Uh, but yeah, letting him feel like he won the battle a little bit and he's also contributing to the bottom line. But the guy, for example, this one particular guy has been with me so long, he's a part of the profit sharing. And so he sees the bottom line. He knows the difference it makes. Uh, another question. Uh, what bennies do you guys offer? Health, dental, 401k? Uh, we offer the full, we offer a full line of benefits, um, health, dental, vision, life insurance. Uh, we allowed, we, we're pretty generous with paid time off. Um, I'm not going to get into too many details on that, just because that's kind of what we do. But um, uh, we also do a simple IRA with a, with a company match. Um, and then uh, our benefits, I know people ask about what we what part part of the benefits do you pay? Um, we basically pay about half of the single person um, rate. Um, we adjusted a little bit for the family rates to make it a little bit affordable um, because we've um, we've seen it's really it's really hard to get affordable without really just paying to get to get that affordable for the driver. You know, when I say affordable, like less than say five hundred dollars a month for like the you know driver plus their family. Um, to get those rates down there. Um, so we pay some of that, but not all, nowhere near the half of what we do for the, for the, uh, for the single rates. And, um, and it doesn't come up too much, but, you know, sometimes that is, that is a disadvantage when you're going up against uh, some of the other bigger companies that, that can offer a little bit more, but that's what we do. And it's, it's been pretty good. We get a lot of, I got a lot of guys. Oh, we also offer, um, if the driver drivers can purchase Aflac policies through us and things like that too, so um, it's been a it's uh, it's been a good it's been a good program, and we've got I'll say about 15 to 20 of our you know 40 drivers are on one of our health plans. We're about the same on that. We have the simple plan, and we contribute on their costs for their medical as well. I haven't uh, looked into doing the family. That's a good idea. I like that, helping a little bit on. Okay. That's huge. Yeah, we'll go, we'll, it's we'll, hard recruiting against the big company for that right there. They'll take five yeah. cents a mile work yeah, for them. I hate that part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when we when we and I went up and I'd, I'd compare and I asked them, so what what's what's your rate at this other company? You know, for a family, they were down in like you know three or four hundred dollar a month range, and for what we were paying, we were up in the it was like seven or eight hundred dollars. So you know, you're looking at you know some of these guys are their rent, their mortgage, or you know another car or whatever they're whatever they're paying there, and they weren't willing to do that. And so uh, yeah, it's it's a big thing. So we reduced it to get it more affordable. It's still not, it's still hard to get it down to the you know that three or four hundred dollar level that you might pay with a with a big company, but um, it does it does help. So yeah, we have we have full complement, right? Uh, health, vision, dental, life insurance. We're rolling out short-term disability now. Um, and um, we have a simple IRA with matching contributions like Kyle mentioned, we do that. Um, we actually have a health reimbursement account that covers a lot of the cost of, a, of, of the deductible as well. Um, and so we, we feel that... Um, in, in some markets, we're the only contractor, so we're competing with other with other places. In other markets, there are many, many contractors, and it's definitely a competitive advantage for us uh, to have a really strong benefits package. Um, we put a lot of money into it, right? It's not a cheap uh, benefit that we offer, but for some people, it's extremely valuable, and those tend to be, the, especially with the families. We do have family plan that's really affordable for our folks, and um, if we attract people who are taking care of their family, they tend to be really good long-term employees. So it's worth it. Um, our time is pretty much done. Um, 
On behalf of everyone who attended, uh, please allow me to thank you, uh, Kyle, Mike, and Jim, for your generosity of time and insight today. Um, and thank you to everybody who attended and, and gave up some of their valuable time to be here. We're hoping to make this a regular series of conversations with, with new topics, new panelists over time. Uh, if anybody has any suggestions on how we can improve things or topics you like covered or any other thoughts, we'd love to hear from you. Just call uh, call Haldi Tech or email us. Um, and please do consider joining the new Facebook group that we set up called FedEx Brown Line Hall Contractors. Um, and one final note, a shameless plug, I apologize, but for those of you who don't know about Haldi Tech, our software is a web-based solution. Nothing for you to install. We've made it super easy to try out. There's a free 30-day trial. You can create your own account from the website. You don't have to talk to us if you don't want to. You don't need a credit card. Um, but we're happy to hear from you and give you a guided tour or demo if you're interested. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your week and a great weekend. Be well.